Hey gang, thanks for joining us at Two Texas Lobsters React, and today we're going to continue our Napoleon series. This is Napoleon Defeats Russia, Friedland 1807. If you haven't already, please smash that subscribe button, ring the notification bell, like, share, and subscribe our videos. And without any further ado, let's go ahead and get into Napoleon Defeats Russia, Friedland 1807. March collaboration, supported by our sponsor, Skillshare home of more than 22,000 online classes. Find out about our exclusive special offer at the end of the video. One week before Christmas 1806, French Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte arrived in the Polish city of Warsaw, then part of Prussia. A year had passed since his great victory over the Austrians and Russians at Austerlitz. And two months since he'd hammered the Prussians at Jena. But Russia still had powerful forces in the field. The most important of which was the Russian First Army, commanded by General Bennigsen. Napoleon would not be master of Europe until it was defeated, and Russia and Prussia forced to make peace. But that winter, Napoleon's first attempt to trap Bennigsen near Potusk got bogged down in thick Polish mud. The Russians withdrew to Białystok. The French army, half starved and frozen, was ordered into winter quarters. While in Warsaw, Napoleon began a famous affair with a young Polish noblewoman, Marie Walewska. In the late 18th century, the once mighty Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth had been swallowed up by its neighbours, Russia, Austria and Prussia, in a series of annexations known as partitions. Until in 17... <clears throat> Do you know that um, Napoleon was, he fancied himself a writer? Really? Under the battle-hardened exterior of Napoleon, he fancied himself as a writer. In fact, he wrote a 17-page novelette called Clisson et Ejouni. Mm. It was 17 pages, and it was not that memorable. I think you can actually still get that book. And he wrote a series of soppy love letters, too. Really? Yeah. To, to her? I don't know if it was to her. It might have been to several women. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure he had them all over. I know. Well... His wife actually cheated on him, too, while he was away at war, so I guess they both played. In ninety-five, a third and final partition wiped Poland off the map. Poor Poland. Now, Polish patriots looked to Napoleon as their savior, praying that his victories against their occupiers would lead to the rebirth of a Polish state. Marie Walewska became Napoleon's mistress in order to further this cause. Hmm. Ordinary so French soldiers, however, had little love for... <clears throat> yeah, I guess so. He was a pawn, wasn't they he? just wanted someone to take it back so they could basically become a country again, and that's what she was doing. She's playing both sides. Is that right? Hold on, I'm going to rewind that a little bit. Their occupiers would lead to the rebirth of a Polish state. Marie Walewska became Napoleon's mistress in order to further this cause. Mm -hmm. Ordinary French soldiers, however, had little love for Poland. It was impoverished, freezing, and they missed home. Desertion rates soared. There were even a hundred cases of suicide. Well, Bet. Napoleon actually tried to commit suicide. Really? April 13th, 1814, 14. 14, he actually took, he carried poison with him all the time. But in 1814, he had lost his empire, his throne, his wife, and his son. And as, uh, as opposed to being exiled, he tried to commit suicide by taking the poison. The problem was that he had poison with him, the same poison, for 10 years. So all it did was make him sick. <laughs> So uh, Backfire. <laughs> yeah. A cup of tea and a night of sleep, and he was just fine, I guess, the oh, next no. morning. <laughs> Marshal Ney 
commanding 6th Corps, sent patrols towards Heilsberg, looking for better quarters. What they found were Russian and Prussian soldiers on the move. They'd stumbled into a surprise winter attack by Bennigsen. Napoleon quickly laid a trap for the Russian army, ordering Ney and Bernadotte to retreat and lure Bennigsen west, while he led the rest of the army north to fall on his flank and rear. But the Russians captured a French courier carrying the Emperor's orders to Marshal Bernadotte. Bennigsen, now warned of the trap, ordered a retreat, fighting a series of rearguard skirmishes against the pursuing French. But he refused to give up the city of Königsberg without a fight, and turned to give battle at Eilau. Hmm. The Battle of Eilau, fought over two days, was one of the most brutal of the Napoleonic Wars, fought in freezing conditions, with neither side backing down. Marshal Augereau's 7th Corps, advancing into the face of a snowstorm, lost its way and was cut to pieces by Russian cannon fire. Wow. <laughs> Five French eagles were lost. What does that mean? Napoleon's army was five, five French eagles. Is that like a flag or a banner? Because I notice in the Prussian, when Napoleon defeated Prussia, they had captured a number of standards and flags. And I guess back in those days, that was the proof that I don't you. Know. We need to look it up. If you know, in the put down in the comments, what does that mean about the standards being captured? That's interesting. Do you think that was people? Only say. Like, no, I don't. I think it was some a standard was like a like a flag, a banner, and I wonder if to prove that you were the victor of that battle, you had to capture their flag. Capture the flag. If you know, put down in the comments. That's very interesting to me. Saved by a devastating massed cavalry charge by ten thousand horsemen, led by the fearless Marshal Murat, and remembered as one of the great cavalry charges in history. At Eilau, for the first time as Emperor, Napoleon failed to win a clear victory on the battlefield. He and the Russians covered up the true scale of their losses, but both sides are estimated to have lost a third of their armies in the carnage. After the horrors of Eilau, both armies sought time to rest and recover. Meanwhile, the newly formed French 10th Corps under Marshal Lefebvre besieged Danzig, held by 13,000 Prussians under General Kalkruth. The city came under heavy French bombardment and infantry assault. After eight weeks, with no prospect of reinforcement, the Prussian garrison surrendered on the 27th of May. Napoleon's northern sea flank was now secure against any possible Russian landing. The French Emperor now commanded an army 190,000 strong Golly against man. just 115,000 Russian and Prussian troops. But it was Bennigsen who moved first, launching a surprise attack against Ney's 6th Corps on the 5th of June. Ney conducted a brilliant fighting withdrawal and escaped. Bennigsen, having lost the element of surprise, and with Napoleon advancing, retreated once more. Four days later at Heilsberg, the French lost 10,000 men in a botched assault against Russian defences. But the Russians continued their retreat the next day. Napoleon thought Bennigsen would head north to Königsberg, but instead he retreated northeast, keeping to the east bank of the Alle River. Mm. So when Napoleon's army marched north, it was Marshal Land's reserve corps on his right flank that next encountered the Russian army, near the small town of Friedland.
Wow, that's something else, man. In the late afternoon of the 13th of June, Russian cavalry scouts informed General Bennigsen that they'd found a single French corps at Friedland. Bennigsen decided he had time to cross the Aller River and smash this isolated corps, before the rest of the French army could arrive to save it. And he ordered his army to begin crossing the river. Marshal Lannes, commanding 16,000 men and facing 46,000 Russians, sent an urgent message to Napoleon that he was under attack from the main Russian army. Then he fought a skillful delaying action, hiding the weakness of his force behind a large screen of skirmishers, while gradually yielding ground to the enemy. Lan was still holding off the Russians as darkness fell. That night, Russian engineers built three pontoon bridges at Friedland. <laughs> Can you to imagine speed that? the movement of troops over, over the river? <laughs> it never ceases to amaze me how these engineers that they carry with them can build like massive nice. bridges and boats and tunnels. Overnight. And, yeah. It takes us nowadays to work on a highway it takes 10 years 10 years exactly <laughs> but they and can then build bridges after the 10 years is over they break it start all <laughs> over again but Bennigsen was taking a huge risk if this turned into a major battle his army would have to fight with its back to the river and the steep banks of the mill stream dividing its left wing from its right Bennigsen had also badly underestimated the speed at which Napoleon's Grande Armée would react. Mm. The first French reinforcements arrived that night. They didn't mess around, did they? Mm -mm. The Emperor himself wasn't far behind. He was an excellent tactician. By dawn on the 14th of Napoleon. June, about 40,000 Russians had crossed to the west bank of the Aller River. I mean, my goodness, Benixen how many battles has, an he, attack has on the he village fought of already? I don't know. Just watching the series. I can't wait to see how it ends. Now, I mean, I know that Napoleon was, he went from zero to hero and then back to mm -hmm. zero again. Uh, but it's going to be interesting to see how the series turns out. Rixdorf to turn the French left flank. But French cavalry reinforcements, led by General Grouchy, intercepted the Russians. In more than an hour of charge and countercharge, the French horsemen finally drove the Russians back. Marshal Mortier's 8th Corps now arrived to reinforce the French center. Sotlak Wood, General Udino's elite grenadier division, fought stubbornly against Prince Bagration's left wing, but was outnumbered by the Russians and gradually pushed back. Around noon on a sweltering day, Napoleon himself arrived. Uh oh, now it's going to go down. He was soon followed by First Corps, commanded by General Victor standing in for the wounded Marshal Bernadotte, as well as Ney's 6th Corps and the Imperial Guard yeah, under Marshal Bessier. 119,000, 190,000 to 115,000 men. And, but no telling how many were lost here on what mm -hmm. sides yet. The date, the 14th of June, held special significance for Napoleon. It was the seventh anniversary of his great victory over the Austrians at Marengo. A good omen, he declared. The battle then entered a lull as Napoleon assessed the situation, saw Bennigsen's dangerous position, and issued orders for an attack to take advantage of it. Bennigsen, meanwhile, who was tormented by ill health throughout the day, 
saw that he now faced the full might of Napoleon's army and issued orders for a retreat. Mm, smart move. Mm. But now that bridge is built. Right. Now so they're the just going to go after him. Yeah, the French can use it now. <clears throat> but before Bennigsen's retreat could get underway, at 5.30 p.m., three salvos from the French guns signaled the start of Napoleon's attack. It was led by Ney's 6th Corps on the right wing, <clears throat> who first cleared Bagration's infantry from Sotlak Wood. That didn't but take as long. Ney's troops left the cover of the trees, they came under heavy fire from Russian cannon across the river. As the French attack faltered, Prince Bagration rallied his men and launched a cavalry counterattack. Ney's corps retreated. But now General Victor's 1st Corps came up on his left. Its artillery commander, General Senarmont, advanced with 30 guns and blasted the Russians at point-blank range with case shot. Hundreds of Russians were mown down within minutes. Wow. Under this onslaught, Bagration's men began to waver and then retreat. Around 7 p.m., the Russian Imperial Guard launched a desperate counterattack to try to halt the French advance on Friedland. They just keep getting they pushed back further and further. And outgunned. As exploding shells began to start fires in Friedland, the French center and left wing joined the attack. Oh my goodness. Here it comes. the escape route under threat the entire Russian army began a panicked retreat towards the river. But Friedland's houses and bridges were now ablaze. The town became a deadly trap for the Russians. Many were drowned trying to cross the river. Others killed or captured. North of Friedland, some units were able to escape across a ford or along the river bank but there was no disguising the Russians' terrible defeat. <laughs> That's amazing. The Battle of Friedland was one of the most decisive victories of Napoleon's career. At the cost of 10,000 casualties, he had inflicted twice as many losses on the Russians. About 20,000 men, killed, wounded or taken prisoner. 40% of Bennigsen's army. The Prussians abandoned Königsberg the next day, which was occupied by Soult's 4th Corps, while Bennigsen's shattered army retreated across the river Niemen into Russia. Tsar Alexander's advisers implored him to make peace with Napoleon. He accepted their advice, and a ceasefire was agreed. Alexander and Napoleon met for the first time aboard a raft in the middle of the river Niemen, near Tilsit, wow. and developed an immediate rapport. Tilsit proved to be one of history's great diplomatic summits, as the two emperors fated each other for days, with banquets, parades and concerts, then discussed affairs late into the night. A friendship of sorts developed while Russia's former ally, King Frederick William of Prussia, was left out in the cold. <laughs> and it was wow. Prussia who would lose most in the Treaties of Tilsit, signed two weeks later. One third of fall, Prussian guy. territory oh, yeah. was taken away to create the new Kingdom of Westphalia, to be ruled by Napoleon's 22-year-old brother, Jerome, and the Duchy of Warsaw, to be ruled by the King of Saxony, which Polish patriots hoped would prove a stepping stone on the road to their own state. <clears throat> Polish troops were recruited into the Grande Armée, with Polish lancers even forming part of Napoleon's elite Imperial Guard. Russia only had to give up the Ionian Islands. 
as Alexander accepted an alliance with Napoleon that left the French Emperor master of Europe. That's all they had to give up. Alexander Maybe. even agreed to join the Continental so System. So, they basically just surrendered, not just the armies, but they surrendered everything. Well, and yeah. got nothing in return. Mm-mm. Well, they got their you-know-what's kicked, and yeah. <clears throat> that's how war works. I guess sad. it's what, what's really sad is even in today's world 2023 that we're still like Russia is still trying to take over pieces yeah. of the you know the countries that don't belong to them that, that <clears throat> it just doesn't make any sense to me why in today's world our minds still turn to war for no yeah. good reason hmm. no it's the economic blockade of Great Britain which banned British ships and goods from all French-controlled ports. The system had been established the previous winter by Napoleon's Berlin Decree. <clears throat> Napoleon hoped that by cutting off British trade with Europe, he'd cause financial chaos and political upheaval in Britain, allowing him to make a favourable peace. There was just one problem. The continental system didn't work. Not only was it impossible to enforce and undermined by widespread smuggling, the system damaged French trade just as much as British trade. The decisive weapon in this economic war would prove to be the British Royal Navy, which that summer ensured its continued naval dominance by launching a preemptive strike against the neutral Danish fleet at Copenhagen, capturing their warships before they could fall into Napoleon's hands. Royal Navy squadrons blockaded all major French ports, seizing any ships trading with France, while ensuring British merchants could continue to trade overseas in relative safety. Hmm. The Navy even seized the tiny Danish island of Heligoland as a base for smuggling British goods into Europe. But most disastrously for Napoleon, the continental system would draw him into two conflicts that proved ruinous for his empire. Mm. The first would be fought in the Iberian Peninsula, where Napoleon decided to force Britain's ally, Portugal, to join the continental system. In November 1807, French troops, supported by their Spanish ally, invaded the country. The Portuguese royal family fled to their colony of Brazil as the French occupied Lisbon without a fight. Wow. It looked as though Napoleon had won yet another easy victory. Oh, ship going first. But the Peninsula so War the was so just cool. beginning. Mm. Thanks to our sponsor. Wow, that was really cool. I think it was great. You know, the French also occupied Vietnam for a time. Really? They were conquered by, Viet by the French. Hmm. That's right. And that's why when you hear uh, Vietnam, uh, a lot of Vietnamese music, there's a lot of French, uh, French, French music, culture. French culture in it. And also, you know, the Bon Mies are on French bread, mm -hmm. French baguettes. And yeah, so a lot of the French culture still exists in the Vietnamese culture because yeah. they were once yeah, I can see that. ruled by them. Mm-hmm. Wow, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, if you have any comments or you'd like to see us do something else, uh, please just leave it in the comments below. Uh, we love to get those. I do answer, uh, right now I can answer each and every one of them, so please keep them coming. Uh, anything? That's it. All right, we've got some great things ahead of you. Thank you so much for your patience. Thank you for your well wishes. I got my bandages off. I'm still healing. But thank you for everyone that sent their well wishes. I feel much better. And we'll see you next time. Bye.